let's try to have some nice time together. Um, can you just now help me somehow? How can I share? Yes. So this. at the bottom, yes. And let's then, see. So do you see now my lecture? I the can see one. the slides and I'm... Yes, uh, but we're not seeing the right visualization. Can you go on display settings at the top? Sure. Display settings, okay, because uh -huh. I put it as a presentation. So what should I do? Uh, swap, do you know? swap, present uh, view oh, yeah. and okay. Okay. That's it, thank it's you. It's now fine. It's perfect, thank you. Okay, all right. So um, you choose as a moderator or even the, the uh, participants, if you want, maybe my two lectures are somehow connected, very good connected uh, by the topics. So um, we can either go through both of them in a series and then maybe have a larger and longer discussion if you like, or we can split like initially planned. Uh, to deliver this lecture first, then the questions, answers, and then the second, however you like, okay? I just have a feeling maybe it would be good if we would go to both of them and connect it, okay? So the first title, um, uh, title of the first lecture is a partial tumor irradiation, which is something that I'm dealing uh, here in Medaustron, both clinically and preclinically. So in terms of the clinical and preclinical research, uh, but also, uh, uh, since many years, I am working in this field because uh, the non-targeted effects of radiotherapy, bystander and upscopal effects are my great passion. So I have dedicated a lot of time, many years, uh, uh, to work and research in that field. And this is uh, the product of that uh, um, research, okay? So I'm going to talk about the PATI approach, which is a kind of spatially fractionated radiotherapy that is unique and the novel. Uh, PATI is abbreviation for the partial tumor irradiation targeting hypoxic segment and represents a novel unconventional immunomodulatory approach that was purposefully designed uh, for the exploitation of the non-targeted effects of radiotherapy. Practically, the idea was to add uh, immune mediated some additional anti tumor uh, component to radiation in terms of the immune mediated tumor cell killing, you know. Uh, so it was developed and described for the first time back in 2015 using the photons in terms of the SBRT patty, and later on, starting back in 2020. Uh, the particles, especially carbon ions, were integrated into this novel approach uh, when I have started to call it either particle patty if the mixed approach using both protons and carbon ions is concerned or carbopathy if only the carbon ion treatment is integrated into the project. So uh, if we talk about this novel approach, uh, this is actually the mix of the most immunogenic radiotherapy features. At least we try to mix most uh, immunogenic features of radiotherapy into one single approach. As I again said, trying to improve the therapeutic ratio uh, in the treatment of highly complex and hard to treat bulky unresectable recurrent tumors by adding to the direct uh, tumor cell killing using radiation an additional immune mediated tumor cell killing component. So practically we started to use the carbon ions more and more instead of the photons and protons uh, to prescribe and to deliver highly heterogeneous radiation dose which is completely opposite to the conventional way of uh, treating and delivering with the highly homogeneous dose, targeting for the purpose of this treatment, uh, the hypoxic target or hypoxic tumor segment for which uh, we, uh, uh, in, from, because of the certain reasons, believe it is a more immunogenic than the normoxic one. And especially then to deliver this approach at the very precise timing uh, sparing peritumoral immune microenvironment as an organ at risk. And I will go now through all these uh, uh, issues slowly 
so that I can explain what I mean by all these uh, uh, words here. So uh, the party approach has actually three key components. One, as I said, partial irradiation targeting the hypoxic tumor segment. Number two, sparing of the peritumoral immune microenvironment as a new real organ at risk. And what I like to call number three, time synchronized immune guided tumor irradiation. I will explain soon what all this means. So this translational oncology research started back in 2010 uh, when I moved to the University of Miami, where I, I wanted practically to explore some ideas on this approach that I had at that time. Uh, so if the partial tumor irradiation is concerned, uh, the question was which part or subsegment of the tumor do we want to target as a target for the partial tumor irradiation? One thing was obvious. Uh, I already said, so uh, non-targeted effects of radiotherapy, bystander and abscopal effect phenomena are at least in a good part mediated by the immune system cells. So uh, in order to induce and generate these effects, Immune system cells, uh, at least at the local regional level, has to be spared. So uh, that was uh, the reason why I've been thinking about the partial tumor irradiation at that time. And then again, since this is concerned, uh, the question was which part of the tumor needs to be targeted. So we have performed there uh, in the preclinic in terms of the in vivo in vitro experiments series of uh, uh, experience, uh, experiments in order to understand uh, and to answer this question. So what we found was that if we expose uh, the hypoxic tumor cells uh, to the high ablative radiation dose, uh, this combination correlated compared to all other combinations to the strongest bystander and abscopal effect that have been seen uh, into the experimental uh, conditions. So knowing then also that the tumor hypoxia in vivo in the real life is a very important source of the um, local regional immunosuppression, then it was clear at that time that as a target for partial irradiation, we want to treat the hypoxic tumor segment. So that is how the concept was born at the level, at the stage of the preclinical research. Um, so practically by delivering very high doses to that partial volume, so to the hypoxic tumor segment, the idea was to practically try to neutralize or to damage, uh, destroy uh, that source of the local regional immunosuppression. And by doing that, practically uh, automatically to convert um, immunosuppressive into the immunostimulative uh, local regional uh, tumor microenvironment, uh, finally uh, aiming to be immunostimulative and to improve the therapeutic ratio. So this slide here, represents actually uh, the indication for the PATI approach. Here you see how the typical uh, PATI patient looks like. So uh, as you can see, uh, these are practically the tumors that you don't want to meet in the clinic. Um, these are all uh, unresectable, recurrent, bulky tumors that are typically unsuitable for the conventional radiochemotherapy uh, because of the tumor volume that is very large, because of the very intimate relationship uh, to the nearby critical structures and organs. Um, and, and in most of the cases, because they were previously already irradiated. So practically by the mean of conventional radiotherapy, and with that, I mean whole tumor irradiation, against these tumors, you really can do much, or you are, uh, um, these patients are usually predestined for the uh, 
um, uh, palliative care or best supportive care. So we are offering to these patients the PATI approach. At the beginning, I have started to use this approach in 2015, delivering the single ablative dose of 10 or 12 gray in single fraction prescribed to 60, 70% isodose line that later on was escalated up to 15 grays times three uh, heterogeneously delivered, um, which is our current uh, standard here. Um, why I'm doing that? Because, and this is now the, the great topic of uh, 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 modern radio-oncology, what radiation dose is the most immunogenic one? So you have uh, many evidence on this, and I will show in the second lecture uh, which evidence do we have now, but they are mostly contradictory or apparently seem to be contradictory because they are showing how uh, low doses or even very low doses uh, or intermediate doses up to ablative or extremely high radiation doses, all they can be immunogenic. Uh, my opinion is that simply the most immunogenic radiation dose does not exist uh, and will never be possible to define this dose in form of a magical universal number that in all cases for each patient and its tumor, uh, will be most immunogenic. This is not realistic simply because uh, that effect, immunogenic effect, depends on so many different factors, some of which are known, but many others still uh, unknown. And so if that is uh, uh, the true, then since I don't know what most immunogenic radiation dose is, I want to deliver to the tumor and to the patient, uh, highly heterogeneous dose, and with that extended range of the doses, which is represented on this uh, 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 slide here, you see an example by prescribing 15 grade times one to 70% isodose line, you can see how moving from the surface of the tumor and the tumor microenvironment, the dose range from zero or one gray in case of PATI approach, uh, reaching 19 grays in single fraction in the tumor center. So by doing that, I practically want to increase the possibility and probability of catching the most immunogenic dose in that moment for that patient and his tumor, uh, uh, no matter what that dose would be. And number one reason, uh, I believe that uh, even low or high or intermediate doses can trigger different immunogenic uh, mechanisms uh, in the cells or microenvironment resulting in the immunostimulation. Uh, so by doing this, we practically want to increase the probability of being immunostimulative. On the left side, you can see how one typical PATI uh, plan looks like. Uh, my uh, physics collaborator would tell you that the most um, uh, challenging uh, part of the treatment planning is definitely the sparing of this uh, phantom organ, which we call PIM or peritumoral immune microenvironment, where we have the immune system cells. Uh, on this example here, you see how by uh, delivering 45 gray in three fractions, this PIM organ or peritumoral immune microenvironment is very well spared, uh, having like 30% of the organ receiving zero gray, having mean dose of only four gray in three fractions, and the 50% of this organ receiving only 0 0.8 gray in three fractions. Uh, it is not always nice. It's like that. This is just one example. But of course, there are cases where, based on the relationship of the tumor and the nearby organs and the PIM, it is hard to be uh, so immune sparing. Okay. Uh, the next topic I mentioned was the timing of the PATI delivery. Uh, and this is actually, uh, if, if I can say, the critical missing link 
because you know that the immune system activity is not the never ending uh, process that is always at the plateau or top of the activity. It is not like that. The activity of the uh, anti-tumor response, immune activity is rather oscillates constantly, switching on and off periodically. Um, um, this is something that is homeostatically determined, you know? So you have ups and downs. You have the phases when the immune system is very hungry about the uh, tumor antigen. So in other words, very reactive uh, in response to our treatment. But there are also other phases when homeostatically it goes to sleep or to recover. It is less reactive and will uh, not respond to the typical stimuli uh, in a maximum way. So the idea behind this time-synchronized immune-guided uh, party delivery was to connect and to synchronize our treatment delivery time uh, with the most reactive phase of the immune system activity or anti-tumor immune response. So for the purpose of the ongoing prospective of patients based on the values of certain uh, biomarkers from the peripheral blood, that practically we believe can tell us when the right time is or when immune system is at most reactive. So seriously, uh, like two weeks prior to the treatment, we are assessing, we are performing the blood draws, assessing certain biomarkers like the CRP, LDH, interleukin-2, interferon gamma, lymphocyte monocyte ratio, etc., in order to get the cures and as you can see on this slide, this is what you get if you uh, assess all these biomarkers from the blood. You can send folds in approximately seven days cycle. This is one cycle uh, um, um, uh, that has duration of seven days where you have in the first uh, few days rising activity, reaching then the plateau maximum of the immune activity and then going to sleep or to recover before basically what we do uh, after we got these cures we then deliver for the first arm uh, party approach in the best time we believe would be uh, or in other words when we believe that the immune system is at most reactive and then in the second arm in order to catch the differences uh, regarding this timing issue, we delivered the treatment at the worst possible time. So after the plateau, where we believe that the immune system gets to recover, goes to sleep, and is less reactive. So the first available data on this were published, and they actually uh, confirmed that if optimally synchronized with the immune cycle, uh, uh, party approach will result bystander and abscopal effect generation. These are all papers that have been uh, published on the party uh, approach so far. Uh, approximately 120 patients have been treated. There are many clinical papers. Some of them are preclinical or even laboratory uh, papers where we try to understand better the mechanisms behind the party responses. And I will show you that a little bit later. So the first available uh, data on outcomes reflect the safety and uh, uh, effectiveness of this treatment in terms of both uh, local tumor control, uh, uh, tumor uh, shrinkage, but also distal effects in terms of the abscopal systemic anti-tumor response. So let me guide you now through the, uh, uh, some radiobiological issues related to this approach. Uh, so far, I use this approach to treat practically uh, tumors in every single uh, site in the body, from the head down to the pelvis, including. Um, uh, the data on safety show practically that uh, no other side effects other than the fatigue or flu-like symptoms have been reported uh, in these 120 patients. What this means that 
uh, some of them, maybe up to one third, uh, uh, report on the flu-like symptoms a uh, few days or in the first week following the treatment. Uh, this means that they are reporting saying like they feel a little bit more uh, weak, like feeling like to be ill, having even maybe uh, the uh, mild fever uh, in the night. Uh, I interpreted these uh, symptoms with the immune system activation and it correlates pretty well good with the treatment response. So here you can see some examples what can be achieved and done by using this approach. This is a, a metastatic melanoma patient uh, having this bulky lesion that is not responding, was not responding to the immune therapy in the left neck uh, and was treated with single fraction 10 grade to 70% isodose line. Uh, the patient had, in addition, also uh, this, uh, um, let me see just, if I can point that option, yes. So the patient also had here uh, this smaller lymph node metastasis that was left untreated, but which completely disappeared following the partial irradiation of this dominant bulky mass in the ipsilateral neck. So here you can see both wonderful bystander effect, but also a full complete abscopal effect. Another case is this uh, very large, huge, uh, hepatocellular carcinoma. Again, patient had uh, in the upper part of the ipsilateral uh, liver, uh, satellite small lesion that was left untreated. We treated with three fractions this time, just this dominant mass. And these are the results after only one month in terms of both bystander, but also again, abscopal effect. Um, what is important here to tell also in terms of the radiobiology, again, uh, that both phenomena, so bystander and abscopal distal systemic antitumor effects, uh, was possible to observe, of course, in the case of traditionally called hot or immunogenic tumors, like this desmoid uh, tumor, sarcoma-like tumor uh, in, the, in the pelvic area. So here again, you can see following the three fractions of 10 gray to the partial volume, almost complete response in terms of the bystander effect, but also regression of unirradiated uh, 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 metastasis in the abdominal wall due to the abscopal effect. Uh, interestingly, it was possible also to observe these phenomena uh, in traditionally called cold or not immunogenic tumors like this very metastatic breast cancer. So this uh, uh, female patient joined the trial uh, because of this metastatic uh, primary breast cancer with this dominant symptomatic lesion in the sternum uh, that was our target for the partial irradiation. In addition, patient had also bilateral neck lymph node metastasis and the primary tumor in the left breast was uh, uncontrolled. She tried to get some results uh, uh, and, and she received the neoadjuvant chemotherapy, but unfortunately was in progression. And this is here what happened uh, like two months later, we achieved practically the full total response to the partial irradiation of only this dominant mother mass. Uh, also, the unirradiated lymph node metastasis completely disappeared, but guess what? Also the primary of the breast that was left uh, untreated completely disappeared. Another one case, a uh, very interesting case of uh, uh, synchronous primary bulky of the rectum, but also second primary uh, of the colon that was left untreated. We have treated just this dominant mass here on trial. Uh, the patient represented also mesorectal lymph node metastasis that were left untreated. And then two months later, uh, in terms of the bystander, almost complete response, uh, patient was converted to the resectable disease, potentially curable disease. And the, the second primary of the colon that was left untreated also responded to the treatment of the primary in rectum and also the anti-radiated lymph node metastasis completely disappeared uh, in terms of the abscopal effect. 
Um, regarding the response dynamic, uh, there are certain tumors. Usually, I have observed fast growing tumors also respond. When they respond, they respond very fast to the treatment. This is a case of the lymph node metastasis of the squamous cell carcinoma in the head and neck treated with just single fraction 10 gray prescribed to 70% isodose line. Here is the plan. And these are the results in terms of 50% tumor volume regression after only two weeks. In other tumors that were slow growing, uh, also the slow response to treatment was observed, like in the case of this dead differentiated liposarcoma uh, that took several months before reached uh, the, the, the criteria to be radically resected. Another one, um, case example. So this patient, young patient, was affected by an unresectable primary adenoid cystic carcinoma of the left lung. As you can see, uh, the problem was, uh, or, or what this figure represents, is that uh, uh, these effects can also be observed and induced using this approach, even in those patients affected by the radioresistant tumors, like this adenoid cystic carcinoma, or this grade two liposarcoma that was also converted to the resectable disease, but previously was practically a uh, highly palliative case. Um, in about 20% of the cases, it was possible also to induce the complete response following just a single course of the PATI approach, one to three fractions. Um, last, not least, uh, in certain tumors, the response uh, lasted for a short time uh, following, again, just one single course of PATI approach that can be even repeated uh, uh, several times. Uh, like in the case of this secondary germinoma that lasted, the tumor was very huge, and the response lasted for only two months. But then we have other cases of the very aggressive tumors where the response lasted uh, till the last follow-up, which was, uh, in case of this desmoid tumor, 18 months. Um, Last three cases we have treated here were uh, all radioresistant, typically resistant, uh, and very hard to treat tumors, liposarcomas, adenoid cystic carcinoma, uh, that all three were uh, converted to the resectable and potentially curable disease uh, from the poor uh, palliative or highly palliative uh, stage to the potentially curative disease. Regarding the uh, prediction of the abscopality, practically, uh, I can tell that in those tumors where we achieve the response of at least 50% tumor volume reduction or more uh, was much higher probability also to observe and induce the abscopal effects. Um, in these patients that we have treated with PATI approach, uh, we assess them with the prognost palliative prognostic index before the treatment and all day or most of them had the life expectancy of only up to two or three months. On average, following the treatment, their overall survival was increased up to eight months. And my last slides regarding the mechanisms, we have studied using immunohistochemistry and gene expression analysis of the abscopal responding tumor sites uh, to uh, understand the mechanisms behind this approach. And what we found was that in immunohistochemistry, apoptosis-inducing factor was uh, 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 highly upregulated at both partially treated bulky, but also untreated responding abscopal tumor site. As expected, we saw very dense immune reaction in terms of the tumor infiltration by the lymphocytes, at the level of the partially treated bulky. But surprisingly, the same signs of the immune reaction we didn't observe at the responding anti-radiated uh, abscopal tumor sites. Despite that, uh, on those sites, we found very strong expression of cell death inducing cytokines that were even strongly induced uh, than in the partially treated bulky tumor site. And finally, to conclude, uh, I can tell you that the radiotherapy definitely has a great immunogenic potential 
uh, even to break this uh, uh, tolerance and to convert cold into the hot tumor microenvironments. Partial irradiation showed to be effective, safe, and then tolerated treatment that can offer to the patients at least improvement in the symptoms quality of life without related treatment toxicity because of the partial irradiation. Uh, it also offered significant neoadjuvant effect in terms of the tumor downsizing and conversion to the resectable disease. Uh, we are currently running two prospective phase one and two trials uh, to understand better which patients and their disease can benefit at most from this approach. So I would like to thank you very much for your attention. My first lecture on the partial irradiation was finished. I'm just wondering if you want now to discuss this lecture or go directly maybe to the second one and then to make a, a, a large discussion on this topic, radiation and immunogenic effects. Uh, uh, professor, there are only two questions. Um, I would recommend that we look into them if it's okay for you. Yes, okay, of course. So what does lymphocyte monocyte emphasize and relate to the status of the immune status? You can see, so if you do uh, close enough monitoring of their values, not only lymphocyte monocyte, but also all these biomarkers I have mentioned. Uh, and by doing very close, I'm saying daily would be ideal. We did it every, sing every second day for two weeks. You can indeed see that they are oscillating uh, in a very regular manner, in the very regular repeatedly cycles, uh, whereby one cycle has duration of one week. So practically they see that their values in the peripheral blood goes up and down, constantly switching on and off. And so this indicates increase and decrease in the activity, immune system activity that can be measured by using uh, these available uh, biomarkers. Maybe these biomarkers are not the best one, but this was our first choice for the purpose of the pilot study, just you know, to get some feeling on what is happening if we treat on one or another day based on this one here. And so I can tell you if we treat when these uh, values start to rise before they will reach the plateau and start to go down, you really had the chance uh, to improve your distal effect in terms of the systemic anti-tumor radiation induced immune uh, response. Thank you very much for that very comprehensive uh, reply. I have another question. Uh, according to the PATHI approach, how are you able to localize the hypoxic areas within the tumor that have been, that have to be targeted before each fraction? Are you getting PET images on a daily basis? Bravo. Okay, so look, I will start from the beginning. Uh, I have in the preclinical phase of the research identified the hypoxic uh, tumor segment as, let's say, like most immunogenic one. I believe if I treat this one with very high radiation doses, my immune response will be better. So uh, then I I translated these findings in 2015 to the clinic, and I have started to treat the patients according to, to this uh, philosophy. At that time, I was in the clinic where uh, we didn't have available any hypoxia-specific imaging tool. Uh, we didn't have any, like, for example, uh, hypoxia uh, specific PET tracers or PET CTs, et cetera, et cetera. So I, 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 I needed to invent or to use some alternative approach that would bring me there uh, to approximately treat what is hypoxic in these tumors. So what I, I used what I had at that time available in the clinic, and that was the combination of both contrast-enhanced CT and FDG PET. So um by by 
assessing the bulky tumor using these two modalities, you can observe the following things. Giving the contrast injection to the patient and making the contrast enhanced CT, you will have the large peripheral part of the bulky tumor that shows strong contrast enhancement, okay? Peripheral one. Then you have the clear central portion that shows no contrast enhancement at all because it's necrotic. And then you have the junctional part, uh, perinecrotic area that is in between the necrosis and the peripheral hypervascularized tumor part that shows some but weak contrast enhancement following the ejection of the contrast media. So shows hypovascularization, okay? Then if you do the FDG PET CT, you can observe in these three segments uh, similar phenomena uh, in terms of the metabolic activity. This hypervascularized peripheral part will show the hypermetabolism, clear and strong. The necrotic one will show you no activity at all. SUV will be zero. And then you have this that was perinecrotic uh, hypovascularized segment. If you look in the FDG, it will show you some activity. Even if it's low, it is some, it's not zero. It's up to two or, or like that. And I have then connected these two findings and I have contoured and used as a target at the beginning, I'm saying in 2015, uh, the part of the tumor that is hypovascularized in CT and hypometabolic in PET. I called it hypoxic-like segment because based on that imaging, I couldn't say it is really truly hypoxic, but indirectly, I believe it is because it shows very low uh, activity and receives very low uh, blood, you know, and, and the oxygen, et cetera, et cetera. And now for the purpose of ongoing prospective trial here, we are using the ATSM Cuprum 64 hypoxia specific PET CT for the target delineation. Thank you very much. There is another question. Uh, what is yes, the effective please. treatment? What is the effective treatment for metastasis if immunotherapy was failed? Uh, so let me repeat, what is the effect on the metastasis if immune therapy failed? Is that correct is question? The, the question is, um, what is the effective treatment for metastasis if immunotherapy was failed? Oh boy, I, I have some difficulty to understand. Um, can, can, you make, can you change it? Can, can you make can, it a little bit more understandable? Can, can the person who wrote the question maybe... Um, I have some, I'm I, sorry, I apologize, but I have some difficulty to understand the, the sense the point of the question please you you can even you know uh, unmute yourself and, and just ask me if you if you can that's what i suggest yes can the person yeah, yeah. Ask, I, I would unmute and okay. ask the question directly hello everyone Ciao. Is you, my question is uh if uh, the immunotherapy was failed yeah i mean uh, any, uh oh yeah effective not an effective okay. treatment. Yeah, yeah, okay. So, we so should let, me, let, me explain, let me explain through my trial uh, and, and through series that have been published. Um, since this is the experimental and unconventional treatment, we are offering this treatment only and exclusively to those patients that already tried everything, uh, every conventional standard of care, state-of-the-art treatment, and failed. So when they arrive to the stage that they don't have any other therapeutic choice other than the palliative or best supportive care, we are putting them on trial and we offer them uh, something in terms of the partial irradiation. So heavy... Uh, all these patients that, that you saw here that I have treated, uh, were already pre-treated with the standard of care and they failed. So that the surgery is not an option because the tumor is technically not resectable. Uh, most of them, not all, all that were fit 
uh, enough, they received already either chemo or immunotherapy or combination and they failed. If they wouldn't fail, they uh, would not uh, be treated with this approach. So I am practically uh, just treating those that if already received the chemo immunotherapy must not answer to that treatment, respond to, to the, this treatment. So this is like the last station. If our treatment fails, they don't have any other choice. Then their destiny is the best supportive care and they will die. I hope Thank this so was yes. enough, enough and that answered what, what you wanted to know. Okay. Thank you, doctor. Thank okay. you for the question. Okay, so uh, thank you, for uh, Professor Tuban, for that very interesting uh, lecture um, on spatial fractionation.